While there were some lunatics who enjoyed World War II, it was a nightmare for most. No one was truly safe from suffering and death, though there were some jobs which sucked a whole lot more than others. While an argument could be made for almost any job, in this video we're going to discuss seven which we think were among the worst, excluding the obvious ones like standard infantry. The United States Army Air Forces changed the nature of war with bombers such as the B-17 Flying Fortress. And while the B-17 Memphis Belle survived the war with all her crew intact, many B-17 crewmen lost their lives flying daytime missions over German-occupied Europe in the Second World War, with their ball turret gunners being a particularly juicy target for enemy fire. The ball turrets themselves were lightly armoured and sized for a hobbit, and the gunners operated their turrets from fetal positions, sticking their feet up against the plexiglass and folding the rest of their bodies in after. There wasn't room for a parachute in these death spheres, so if their craft was going down, a gunner would have to unseal the locked door separating them from the cabin and strap one on. This, I'm sure, was easier said than done. Ball turret gunners were also far more exposed to the elements, and it gets damn cold thousands of meters up in the air. American poet Randall Jarrell's poem about gunners and sperry ball turrets summed up the experience quite well. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke to black flak and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Using the right ammunition against the right sort of fuel tank, one could make flamethrower fuel tank explode, melting its wielder and scorching the men at his side, though this wasn't as common as it is in video games, and operating a flamethrower was a sucky job for a variety of other reasons. The fuel tanks were heavy, meaning their operators moved slow, and they had to get up close to be in an effective range, throwing hellfire from a standing position. And when they were spitting flame, they may as well have been crying, Hey, shoot the guy wearing me! As well as being cumbersome, flamethrowers were also terrifying, for both those on the receiving and delivering end. Watching someone burn alive, even your enemy, can't be a pleasant experience, and it certainly would have left an emotional scar on anyone who wasn't incinerated in the process. Fear of a peeling, screaming death made flamethrower operators one of the most hated battlefield foes, meaning more soldiers targeted them and fewer took them prisoner. US veteran Herschel Woody Williams described how, on Iwo Jima, he was tasked with clearing a concrete pillbox with a flamethrower. Covered by four other marines, he stuck the thrower's mouth into one of the pillbox's air vents and cooked his enemy alive. He also recalled another battle in which he melted down a Japanese bayonet charge and took note of the machine gun rounds literally ricocheting off his fuel tanks. Combat engineers or sappers had it rough too. Their duty was to pave the way for the rest of the army, constructing fortifications, roads and bridges, and clearing or setting landmines and traps, among other things. In this way, they were sort of frontline troops, and they often had to work in harsh conditions with minimal equipment, forced to improvise as best they could. Stan Hodson of the British Army recalled how the Royal Engineers often built things from salvaged materials and, in one instance, used the bloated corpses of dead horses as anchors for telephone lines. And British Royal Engineer Alderman Bill Astle described the life of a sapper in an interview with the Bedford Museum. You never ceased to train. You were always on demolitions, live demolitions, and studying mines as they were discovered. Sometimes later on, you found yourself dealing with one that you'd never dealt with before, and to say the least, your hands used to shake a bit because at any time, they could go off. Each to their own, but I'd hate to be trapped in a pressurized metal tube under the waves. Both the Axis and the Allies employed submarines in World War II, and life for any submariner would have been terrifying. But the submariners of the German Kriegsmarine had it rough as the war dragged on. In the early days, which were referred to the Germans as the Happy Times, German U-boats were the masters of the sea, carrying out nighttime surface attacks and sinking hundreds of Allied ships. 
Though the Allies soon developed anti-submarine tactics, bringing U-boat submariner casualty rates up to more than 75%. Allied aircraft learned how to spot and destroy U-boats from the sky, and using sonar, their boats and subs hunted them down almost to extinction. On top of this, submariners were constantly exposed to changes in pressure as waves lapped over the sub's diesel engine snorkels. The diesel fumes themselves could also fail to vent, and various other accidents, such as the batteries powering the diesel engines catching fire, could lead to the death of the entire crew. If a sub was hit by torpedoes or other types of enemy fire, water would burst into the compartments and anyone who survived the initial detonations would slide into the abyss, drowning in the dark salt sea as their submarine imploded. Not too far from the end of the war, German U-boat U-1206 was ultimately put under the waves, all because someone took a shit. A poorly sequenced opening of valves following that said shit led to the hull of the U-boat filling with sewage and seawater, which flooded the batteries, generating toxic chlorine gas and forcing her to the surface, where she was attacked by British patrols. U-1206's commander, rather than letting his sub fall into enemy hands, scuttled it. One submariner died in the British attack, three drowned as a result of the scuttling, and the remaining 46 were captured. While some soldiers were assigned body recovery and disposal jobs basically full time, most came face to face with a corpse during the war, and many had the grim duty of moving or disposing of one. Bear in mind, not everyone died clean. Men were blown to ribbons, charred to crisps, bloated with maggots, and rotted to the bone. And often, these men were allies, friends. It was hard and messy work. The US 612th Quartermaster Graves Registration Company was a unit dedicated to locating, identifying, and burying dead American soldiers. Part of why they did what they did was to boost morale, but another important factor was sanitation. Private Thomas J. Dowling of the US 612th described what it was like seeing the faces of the dead. Some stared wide-eyed, others had died in the middle of a scream and their mouths hung open, others had no face at all. In the Normandy landings, the unit had to cut free corpses which had been entangled in landing craft propellers and in colder operations, they sometimes had to thaw frozen bodies just to identify them. Often, the unit had to give corpses a hasty burial before returning later, exhuming them and reburying them properly. Private Dowling also recalled how much of a psychological strain the job was. Not many of us were killed, but we died in different ways. The work was nightmarish and it ate our hearts, cracked some of us, darkened the spirits of others and numbed the rest. Worse still, some prisoners, such as those selected to survive in Sobibor, were made to clean corpses out of extermination camp gas chambers in the Second World War. This must have been a horrific task, especially as the unfortunate souls carrying it out were essentially slaves, bound for a similar fate. One of the absolute worst jobs of World War II must have been serving in a penal military unit, a unit comprised of men convicted of military offences. These men were to be imprisoned or killed for their crime anyway, so military such as the German and Soviet mobilized them into what were basically suicidal frontline forces. So that's it? What, we some kind of suicide squad? If the convicts tried to flee, they were usually shot dead by barrier troops. Strafbatus was Stalin's response to Hitler's penal straf battalions. Many Soviet punishees were men convicted of desertion or cowardice, while others were gulag inmates. To serve in a strafbat was to many a death sentence, though the punishees could atone for their crime by sustaining a significant injury or performing a significant heroic deed. Some strafbat missions even included running through and clearing minefields, and it is estimated overall that they suffered casualty rates of more than 50%, which was between three and six times higher than other Soviet units. One Soviet penal unit survivor recalled, In the first company, 
Out of 198 soldiers who were assigned, only six survived. I then served the second company. They threw us into the most dangerous sectors, sending us to almost certain death, at first even without artillery cover. Now, this last one, funnily enough, is a bit of a stretch. For anyone who didn't cling to Imperial Japanese doctrine, being a kamikaze pilot must have seemed like the worst job ever. Though, we mustn't forget that dying for the Emperor was a great honor to some Japanese pilots. Japanese kamikaze pilot Hisao Horiyama was a devoted subject of the Emperor, though Japan surrendered before he got his chance to prove it. A veteran of the war, Horiyama said, Dying was the ultimate fulfillment of our duty, and we were commanded not to return. I felt bad that I hadn't been able to sacrifice myself for my country. My comrades who had died would be remembered in infinite glory, but I had missed my chance to die in the same way. I felt like I had let everyone down. There were many terrible jobs that needed doing in World War II, though those were just seven of them. Can you think of any others? And in general, what do you think of this video? Would you like to see a second part of it? Because there are plenty more jobs we could list off here. Let us know in the comments section below. And just before you go guys, make sure you check out the links in the description below if you want to join our wider history community. We have a Discord down there where we post all of our video sources and have weekly polls and discussions on various history topics. And we also have a Patreon if you want to help support the channel. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.